Dear colleagues, welcome to EAU TV. We are live from EAU 22 in Amsterdam. My name is Morgan Roupré. I'm the chair of Oncourology Unit in Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital Sorbonne University and the chairman of the European section of Oncourology of the EAU. I'm pleased to welcome today Ashish Kamat, uh, who is a professor of urology uh, in Houston, Texas, and uh, is a regular guest of the EAU events. And we were lucky to have him today. And Ashish. We had a wonderful day, a wonderful day today uh, in um, uh, in Amsterdam about bladder cancer and uh, on a on a broad spectrum, I would say. It, it was great. I mean, there were so many exciting topics talked about, discussed all the way from the basics to the nuances of therapy. It was a really good day for bladder cancer. And uh, so we started the day very early in the morning with the uh, plenary session. And you had the opportunity to start and to launch the session and to deal with a topic about the use of systemic drug in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And so compared to other GU cancer, uh, prostate kidney cancer, the situation is totally different because the drugs are moving to the early phases of the disease. Can you let us know what were you, the, the key messages you wanted to send to the audience on uh, um, uh, on your talk this morning. Yeah, no, absolutely. So as you mentioned, you know, then when it comes to bladder cancer, a lot of the activity has occurred in the more advanced diseases, um, even metastatic disease, where you look at the activity of antibody drug conjugates, such as EV and sasolumumab, and now those are moving into earlier phases, including intravesical phase one studies, which are occurring with EV. Um, but also when it comes to non-metastatic disease, when we look at drugs such as atezolizumab, pembrolizumab, any one of the IO agents um, that have been studied in the metastatic setting, now they're being used in BCG unresponsive disease. There's activity occurring or being studied in the BCG naive setting. So it's very important, as one of our speakers, uh, Fred Butcher, said, we need to keep the medical oncologists as our friends. So, for sure. But uh, if I remember correctly, in the United States, the FDA has approved pembrolizumab in the refractory patient. And since the drug was approved, I think the volume of prescription was quite low, a bit disappointed, because maybe we have to admit that these patients are between the ends of the urologist and they are more keen or interested in the possibility to deliver the drug intravesically. That is absolutely right. And again, you know, I was part of the group that got pembrolizumab approved when it went in front of the FDA. Um, but we also have to remember that the efficacy of pembrolizumab is roughly about 20%, right? So when we talk to our patients and give them the option of a 20% response rate with a systemic drug that potentially has toxicity, versus intravesical therapies such as combination chemotherapy, which is the de facto standard in the US, patients make the decision that's right for them and they tend to choose the intravesical therapy. So I don't think it's just a urology medical oncology thing. I think it's truly based on the data. Yeah, and still the study, uh, or the, the keynote, uh, which has been promoting the PAMBRO is still recruiting in the other cohort of the patient than uh, the non-CIS patient. So, uh, we are facing a situation which is quite rare, with a drug approved and the trial still running. Um, so going back to uh, how patient, I think we have two categories, of course, because any pharma uh, who wants to step in the field of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, is going, is attracted by the refractory patient. It's not an easy entity, but there is no comparator there. So you are quite in a situation uh, where you feel that your drug is going to be successful, uh, do you believe that the next big step is to go into the direction of the patient who are naive of any treatment, or should we stick to the refractory patient? So the reason that most pharma companies have gone in the refractory or the BCG unresponsive setting is because our group and others have created this paradigm and the FDA uh, uh, adopted it, where you can do a single arm study and if you meet certain benchmarks, they will approve the drug. But that is really a niche population. And most drugs and patients need therapy in the naive setting. So absolutely, we need more studies. And are being done. The Potamac study, for example, is in the BCG naive setting. But they require a large number of patients. And the event rates 
are what drive the final analyses. So yeah, you and those are low. You you mentioned it this morning because Potomac is closed. We have in France we have the Alban trial, which is still recruiting patient, is almost closed. But you mentioned that uh, uh, the first outcome or intermediate analysis of Potomac are, have been postponed or delayed. Uh, do you have any explanation? Yeah, I think what's happening is as we've seen the response rates to BCG, which is the control arm have gotten better over time, with better resection, better recognition of CIS, better blue light and NBI and other technologies. So the event number in the control arm is lower than what was thought of historically. And then that drives the interim analyses because if you've seen fewer occurrences in the control arm, you're likely seeing fewer occurrences in the comparator arm because BCG is in combination. And of course, that's something that was not factored in when a lot of these studies were designed. Maybe um, you, you at this point, but we need to emphasize the fact that when you compare a drug in arm A and arm B, there is no surgery. And here uh, we compare patients uh, who undergo surgery in different centers and endoscopic surgery that could be discrepancies according, I would say, to local habits. And uh, so there is probably a bias which is introduced by endoscopic surgery itself. And that's where the surgeon is very important, but hopefully that'll randomize out in a randomized study. But if it's not randomized, then yes, clearly if surgeon A does a better resection and surgeon B does not do a good resection, that would affect the outcomes. So the other thing is the intravesical way. Uh, we have uh, also some uh, uh, new kids on the block in the pipeline. Um, can you let us know uh, what uh, you feel is going to be relevant for the patient and the physicians within the next few months? So I think one big thing is the Nataferi gene, uh, gene therapy. And that was studied and reported. And the data seem fairly good. They're at least as good as pembrolizumab and much less toxicity. That drug, unfortunately, has not yet been approved by the FDA, partly because of manufacturing issues and not any trouble with the data. So hopefully that's one. The other one that's really exciting is the N803, the COLD study which was reported at GEOASCO and ASCO, which is BCG plus the IL-15 superagonist. And the response rates there seem almost too good to be true with very low toxicity. So clearly that is something that we're all excited about that has been filed with the FDA and we're waiting to see if it gets approved. Um, CG007, which is oncolytic virus, in combination with pembrolizumab, again has been reported at ASCO and GEOASCO. Roger Lee is the PI on that. And that again has very high efficacy rates at six months and even nine months in patients that have been analyzed. So that's another very exciting uh, drug that we should all be looking at. And, and thank you. And discussing these trials and uh, also the methodology and the way we recruit this patient, I think the philosophy around this trial has changed in uh, localized disease and you group came up with uh, an international conclusion and statement about the end point. We should choose uh, to judge uh, the outcome of these studies because usually in the field of cancer we stick and this is the case at ASCO most of the time with overall survival. Um, I think it's a little bit unfair in that situation. Uh, I have seen uh, in the literature and at ASCO uh, uh, certain data coming with bladder intact survival rate. Uh, um, so preservation of the bladder Endpoints. Uh, how do you think we should uh, uh, change a little bit the paradigm, uh, uh, thinking about the, the, the accurate endpoint that should be chosen in that particular setting? So, Morgan, that's a very relevant question, but also a difficult question to answer in, in a nutshell. Um, the, we had a workshop with the FDA in November of last year, and that was something that actually we discussed in, in depth. If you look at cystectomy-free survival, that is what is important for the patient. No of question course. about it, right? Mm -hmm. Can I save my bladder? But that is affected by so many variables that it's unfair to use that to have a drug approved because the cystectomy-free survival, even if the drug fails, is still dependent on the urologist and the patient. If a patient does not respond to drug A and comes and sees you, and then you offer the patient five other different drugs, that patient will have a better cystectomy-free survival, but not because of the drug being studied. So that is a very difficult endpoint to use for approval, but it's certainly a secondary endpoint that should be collected. And but there is also a need not only for physicians to be educated on, but with the authorities to discuss, because usually they stick to the so-called classical, I would say, endpoints. And they have to be open-minded to accept the fact that we come up with studies where the endpoints are a little bit different 
I, I agree. I agree. But but recurrence-free survival and progression-free survival are, are really good endpoints. Yeah. Look at. Um, let's move a little bit forward in the natural history of the disease. And now we are going to focus on uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer because I think there were interesting messages coming from the rapid fire debates. And we are, let's start from the clinical situation which happens uh, and that we discussed today where we have from the endoscopic assessment a T2 tumor, a single spot, uh, and we went into the proposal of receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus cystectomy. But there was after the regimen of chemotherapy, the patient was suitable for chemotherapy, uh, there was a re-evaluation, endoscopic re-evaluation. And it's a T0, biopsy are negative. And so the patient is raising the point about why do you take out my bladder? Uh, because I may end up as a T0. And so I see more and more this debate uh, coming uh, not only uh, between the scientific, but between the patient and the doctor. So how can we solve this issue today? Because it is jumping from conservative management for a cystectomy management, and I'm not so sure that we can jump from a regimen to another. Yeah, so bladder preservation is at the forefront of all our patients' minds. No, no patient wants to lose their bladder unless they absolutely have no choice. And this is a common question that we get. My bladder looks good after chemotherapy. Do I need to have my bladder taken out? It's only after the treatment. Correct. It, but the short answer is yes, because all of the studies, whether it's retrospective or subgroup analyses and prospective studies where the patients have retained their bladder, the clinical staging understages bladder cancer notoriously. So more than 50% of the time, there is still tumor in the patient's bladder. And unfortunately, radical cystectomy is the only way to guarantee control. Now, an option of radiation is something that you clearly have to discuss with the patient, and it is an option, but pure bladder preservation with just observation is still a research uh, tool. It's, it's not ready for prime time. So we have to be honest with the patient. Is either trimodality from the beginning or the full regimen? but it's, di it's difficult to jump from an uh, arm to another. Absolutely. Okay, one last point I think what we would like to emphasize is probably the discussion around the oligometastatic disease. It's extremely interesting because we saw this discussion coming out also in prostate cancer, in some GU cancer. So in bladder cancer, the situation, we have no biomarker. We have no extremely accurate imaging. So first point, is TEP imaging, molecular imaging useful uh, in that setting, because the definition of the number of metastases, the location, is going also to be contingent upon the, the, the preoperative treatment workup. Uh, so, what do you see here? So, in bladder cancer, when we talk about oligometastatic disease, we have to separate lymph node from visceral. And if it's lymph node only, if it's in the pelvis or in the retroperitoneum, then there is enough evidence that after systemic therapy, if the patient has a near complete response, a complete response or almost complete response, then surgical consolidation is useful. There's our series from MD Anderson, the Memorial series, the uh, Dutch series that suggest that. So the lymph node staging is very, very important. And after treatment, a positive PET scan in the lymph nodes is an indicator that there's still active disease. So a PET is very useful there. Now, when it comes to visceral metastases, where there's isolated, long, one or two lesions... Bad prognosis. Liver, that's bad prognosis. And that's where I would stick to systemic therapy versus going in and trying surgical resection. Okay. And uh, that's the point. As soon as we are facing this situation of oligometastatic, trying to discuss, there is no consensus, but should we raise the point of treating the metastasis itself by a localized treatment on the metastasis, radiation or surgery? So is it a case-by-case -case discussion? There is no room for localized treatment of the metastasis itself, or what do you think? Uh, localized treatment has to be a case-by-case -case discussion. Radiation has a role to play certain places. Surgery does have a role to play in certain cases, but it's not a one-size-fits-all for sure. Thank you again, Ashish, for uh, coming and flying to Amsterdam. It was a long journey, and we are very pleased to have you on board. And I think we had this uh, great opportunity to discuss all these clinical situations around bladder cancer. So uh, thank you for attending EAU TV and please enjoy um, the uh, last two days of the Congress in Amsterdam, EAU 22, and see you soon on all uh, the communication tools of the EAU. Thank you.